wanted to touch, touch on a couple of uh, key points on what we can do to, to make our band programs, not just band programs, but orchestral programs as well, too, to emphasize the chamber experience for our middle and high school programs. All right? So, essentially, the, the goal of this presentation, as, as directors, we know that we have um, solo and ensemble events that typically take, takes place in the end of January, February, and in some cases, March. Um, I believe, and this is just my thought, and hopefully you, could, um, just, you would agree with this, that the chamber experience should not just take place in the spring, not during solo ensembles. This should happen all year, all right? And with some of the things that we're gonna talk about today, you'll probably agree with me and say, you know what? This is probably a good idea to have the students to buy into the concept of the chamber experience because when it all comes down to it, it makes our jobs a lot easier. All right, when you think about it, and again, we'll discuss some of that in this um, presentation. And it's gonna be facilitated based off of what we're gonna discuss today. All right. So with the needs of, um, of the chamber experience, we all know that having a large ensemble experience for our students is very important. However, if this is all we expose them to, um, they're going to miss a couple of key points in their overall experience. And it comes to the fact that uh, with brass players specifically, they fall into roles, all right? And this is specifically for beginning to intermediate band uh, literature. If you can agree with me when it comes to trumpets, they typically have the melody, and with them have the melody, they're not exposed to the lower register of the instrument. All right. For the horns, you know, we know that the horn is probably the, the brass instrument that has the widest range. And because of the fact that they fall into roles, they are either playing umbas with the tuba in marches, and they are playing literally right in the middle of the set. For low for low brass, specifically for trombones, we're just holding down the melody. I'm not the melody, but the harmony. It's just whole notes, whole notes. All notes loud to walk off stage. All right, that's our lives. All right, and um, because of that, we're not exposed to the melody as much. And of course, with tuba, um, they are exposed to certain articulations, but not all. Specifically, the um, the um, uh, lyrical aspects of playing legato. All right, they don't. They're not exposed to that as much. They're typically playing a game with the marches, boom, 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 boom and thinking that that's all that they have to do for the tuba, but there's more articulation exposed for that particular instrument, all right? So the benefits of it, um, we as music educators, we believe that um, having a chamber ensemble is pertinent and very important to our um, um, overall band program, all right? And because of that, if we focus on having a homogenous setting where you have trombone choir or trombone quartet or string quartet or string choir or whatnot, they are essentially exposed to their um, instruments that, they're exposed to factors of their instruments that are idiomatic to their instruments. So for example, for trombone, we're the only instrument, of course we know, in a band world that has a slide, all right? So we can tackle problems that's dealing with the slide. Same thing for the euphonium, they have their phones and just that for, for valve um, players, for string players, for woodwind players. So by exposing them to the um, chamber music, now they can work together collectively on common issues that they can work together. Because as a band director, you have a full band and you have your flutes in front of you, your clarinets in front of you, trombones are in the back, and they're kind of like the second um, cousin twice removed in the family reunion. All right, you can all agree. You see the trombones, you're like, okay, they'll fend themselves because they have phone They'll be all right. Let me focus on what's important. But really, everyone is important, all right? And by having this setting here, not everyone has a chance to shine, in a sense, all right? So, and um, continuing, also, uh, as I, I kind of referenced this, this will help with the larger issues with tone production problems, um, articulation problems that we would typically find in our own instrument. And you can kind of fill in the blank with your instrument if it's viola, if it's clarinet, if it's saxophone, you're gonna work on certain issues when you work on a homogenous set, all right, in addition to the large ensemble All right, so now um, we're going to give you a demo of um, Haydn's Achieve, his glorious work, and what you will typically see when uh, 
a chamber group starts off. All right, so here we go. And we all know as directors of how we start to come together. It's eye contact. Before the horns roll up, we have to make sure if we don't see your eyes, that means we can't, you know, there's, there's no communication. All right? So there has to be eye contact. The second thing is essentially having the breath. Regardless if it's brass, regardless if it's movements, or even strings, is a breath that dictates the tempo. All right? And then the gesture, what the trombone is essentially like a large baton. All right? And because of the fact that we have this baton, Visually, you can give that downbeat so that way everyone can clearly start to go. All right? So, now we're gonna take the second demo, essentially uh, clarifying what we didn't do the first time. Now, with this assessment here, now granted, yes, we established eye contact, the breath and gesture were not over exaggerated, but essentially it was clear enough to where it uh, emphasized what we're going to do with the tempo. However, you can tell that there was some stylistic problems that, that, that just took place. All right, which leads us to our next point: matching styles. All right. So, with matching styles, we all know that this all goes with making sure that we're listening to the top player or listening to what the melody is saying, what's doing, what's going on with the melody, so that way we can establish common articulation, um, and um, so that way the, the, the message is clear and not fuzzy, all right? Uh, one of the first things that we have to do as an ensemble is just to make sure that we all know our parts. As a former director and as a performer, um, this statement I'm going to make, we, we all know this well. We know that there's a difference between the rehearsal and practice. Students do not. They come to rehearsal to practice. But we know that practice is what you do by yourself, and then you bring your practice to rehearsal, so that way you learn everyone else's parts. So we have to differentiate. If your students do not understand the difference, please make sure that we, we, um, we let them know that yes, there's a difference between practice and rehearsal. You come to rehearsal to practice what you've done on your own, not to practice for the first time. All right, because now we're wasting time. We're wasting everyone's time. All right? Um, also, having the students to listen to the overall ensemble. Once they've learned their parts, now they're able to listen to everyone else's parts so that way they can fit their part into the overall conversation of what's taking place. Right. And one of, uh, another great uh, um, tool is by studying recordings. Now, of course, we have YouTube. You know, some people feel, you know, uh, odd about YouTube because there's great recordings. And then not so good recordings, all right? But we do have other um, uh, platforms out there. Naxos, we have Spotify, 
and other um, um, audio means to where we can use as sources. So essentially based off of what we just discussed, um, now we're able to implement this into our next demo, which will emphasize the articulation, um, the lead player's decision, and being historically informed by reform. All right, so this is our third demo here of Achieve. Instead of saying light and attacks, we say play short. And what happens? 
is when we say play short, physiologically, they stop the air with the tongue. Now they're no longer having this horizontal taste their ankle lucky charms approach. Now they're having this vertical detached approach. All right. So instead of saying play short, again, we want to emphasize if you don't if you, you want to use other terms outside of like and detach, use buoyancy, buoyant, bouncy, or just I mean, if the students know Shaquille O'Neal, think about the bouncing bar every time he talks. Like think subtitles. Okay. Yeah, you get it, you know? So you want to think buoyant, you want to think bouncy, and that's light and detached. There's nothing, sh I always mention that when you think about short and staccato, they're, they're almost like they, they do not mix, all right? Because again, think about it. And, and we've, I've been captive to this as well, too. I've mentioned short until I had to rectify the situation myself. It's like, okay, if I'm a student and I hear the term short, what am I doing? What Dun Merble, Dunwoody Merble, what are you doing when you play short? I'm actually stopping the air with the tongue. Because I'm thinking peck, I'm thinking like, and what you're doing is now you no longer have a core to the note. It's just the front of the note. There's three parts to every note. There's the front, initial attack. There's the core, which is the soul of the note. And then for every articulation, there's a decay. The moment you play short, you no longer have a core and a decay. You just have the front. Now it sounds like a snare drum rather than a tempo. All right, so I admonish you. If you find yourself saying short, no problem. Just rectify by saying, just play light and balance. All right, light and balance, um, light and attach. All right, and this is what I meant by imagery. If you say bouncy, you can think if you see someone bouncing a ball and thinking light and attach. All right, and by using this tool again, it will help um, inspire the students as they continue to work on their music. All right, now we're going to our final demo of, of this selection here, incorporating everything that we just discussed. <laughs> Thank you. 
so small review. No test, I promise you. Small review, just based off of what we've discussed thus far, and making sure that we're essentially um, establishing, by playing together and keeping the style, and making sure that we have communication. Um, we've essentially established everything that you see up here, all right? And most importantly is the last one, sending a message. All right, because again, in music, I, I correlate music as having a conversation. What are you trying to say? Is it worth keeping my attention? This not only happens in jazz. We talk about this all the time in jazz. What are you trying to say for your horn, stylistically and soulistically? No, not just in jazz, but in orchestral literature, in, in, in symphonic literature, in chamber literature. What are you trying to say? Because we all know that it's easy to catch someone's attention. It's even harder to keep it. <clears throat> Especially in today's day and age. After 15 seconds in social media, we all know uh, TikTok, is that TikTok too? Uh, it keeps me young. After, you know, TikTok and all the social media platforms. After 15 seconds, if that, swipe, if it doesn't catch your attention. That's why all the heavy content is towards the front. All right, because if you wait until the last minute to do, to do dynamics, then after a while, think about it. If you're in the audience, after a while, you hear you hear notes, but you don't hear the music. After a while, you think to yourself, "Man, I'm gonna keep a dinner tonight." You're in a concert, but you're not there. All right. So as musicians, we have to do a great job with not just holding the not not just uh, grabbing the attention, but keeping the attention, and that's all established by being consistent with articulation, dynamics, and inflection. All right, so <laughs> we've discussed uh, uh, a number of things that deals with music. Now we're going to switch gears and talk about things that are outside of music, but we're dealing with personalities and what you may see. So stay tuned to what you're about to see in a couple seconds. Playing the tuba carabas. So as you see this, this may have happened. You may this sitting in your in your uh, office, and you have a glass window, and you're watching your ensemble, and you may see something like this. have to work on establishing um, interpersonal and collaborative skills. All right, and again, uh, if you see some of these things are unfolding, these are some of the steps that we can definitely lead into. All right, so <laughs> preach selfishness, selflessness. <laughs> see, almost, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> teach, <laughs> teach selflessness to your students, all right? In today's age, that's hard. Because society, social media, is all about the art of me. All right? It's what I want. Why can't I have it? No, it's my turn. All right? In an ensemble setting, and even in a larger setting, we know this in band that it's not about you. It's about the collective. It's about everyone collectively. All right? 
Now, when it comes to this setting here where you have four or maybe even eight uh, students, depending on, on your ensemble size, it becomes more uh, magnified because now things are exposed. If one person doesn't play, as you've, sung, as you've seen, that things can kind of start breaking down and now students will lose um, sight of what's taking place, all right? Um, use the collective um, tense, all right? You notice I went, I kind of went off on, on one of my students here saying, what are you doing? That was by design because I said, what are you doing? All right, now if something like this were to happen, we would have come together, I was like, all right, now we need to work together and stay focused on this instead of pointing people out. Because you point people out, we all know that now it becomes defensive and now we no longer have a group. We just have a collective group of individuals. Staying engaged, if you saw the little example with the phone, all right? That's a big thing. Um, having a, have, uh, for us to meet in this setting, you want to make sure that the students have their phone elsewhere, all right? For me, and this may be a different philosophy for everyone else, I do not have my students to have their phone on their stands. And this is, if they have, I understand the whole tuning aspect, there's a philosophy of that I wanna talk about for another time. But for the students to have their um, phone on the stands for tuning purposes, that's a good ask, that's a good uh, method for what happens when you start working with the flutes and then you see the trombone section. Once you don't see their eyes, they're doing something else. So what are they doing? Right, all right? So, and that's being distracted because what you're telling the flutes may be applicable to the euphonium section, may be applicable to the tuba section, all right? So, Yes, maybe have their phones out for tuning purposes, but then after that, have the phone up, all right? Because when it comes to tuning, the best tuner is their ear, not a device, all right? Because we know playing B flat in unison is one thing, playing B flat in the chord is another thing, yeah. all right? I just wanna want make sure I can get this out. Don't stone me, all right? <laughs> just a messenger, all right? I've been in your shoes, I was a band director as well too, so I've walked, through, walked this line as well too, all right? And have an open mind to new ideas, all right? This, having an open mind, and this is for, again, for the students to share ideas, because there's nothing worse than having one student to feel as if they're not a part, right? Because what happens psychologically, now they're not giving their best because they're not being heard. Not necessarily through the horn, but that their thoughts are not being heard to, for the collective um, um, uh, goal of taking the piece to the next level, all right? So everyone having an idea, not just the lead player, but everyone having an idea of what we can do, but that's based on informed information. Again, going back to what I mentioned about recordings and um, stylistic uh, approaches by way of articulation. All right, now, this is where you come in, the directors. Um, so, it's the students, you know, we, they, they have their money. <laughs> and, you know, of course, we have boosters and, and, and so on and so forth. And we use the boosters to help provide, help build what the band needs, all right? And typically, boosters are used for marching band purposes because that's the most expensive thing, all right? Of course, we have fees for solo ensembles, FBA and whatnot. But it's also important to invest in ensemble work, chamber ensemble work, so that way students have music to play, you know? And not just rely on Bach chorales. Bach chorales are great, but they can't take Bach chorales to solo ensembles. They can't take Bach chorales and play it for, uh, uh, for a concert during um, your spring concert, all right? So invest in your um, ensembles, and um, so that way they have an array of music that they can use and apply, all right? Ensure that they have rehearsal space. This is very important. And as a matter of fact, by the students not having rehearsal space, it's one of the first things that they'll do is say, you know what, I have nowhere to practice, I'm going home. Or there's no need to practice. All right. So having um, adequate uh, uh, rehearsal space is very important. And if 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 you have your students who are um, uh, interested in having a chamber ensemble, you can say, all right, mo this week Monday it'll be the flutes, Tuesday it'll be the saxophone, Wednesday it'll be the trumpets, Thursday, and then change it up every week so that way everyone has access to um, their own individual room at a specific time. Um, also, this is very important. Find some time to sit in with your students, all right? Just a shadow and just give small hints. You don't want to, like, 
take over the rehearsal, but just to give small hints here and there because you want to see how your students work, given ideas through the music and work together collaboratively, collaborative, all right? Um, so this can be either applied at the beginning stage or and the ending stage. I would probably say do it twice. At the beginning stages, so that way you can establish a couple of things in regards to what we're talking about here, and then let the students work. And then towards the end, I'm coming in, I'm just checking in to see how things are going. I'm just shadowing. And then you're kind of in the back and you're a fly on the wall. You're not sitting in front of them because they'll be intimidated. You're literally across the room, but you're intent, intently listening to what's taking place. And then after about 30 minutes, you come in and say, All right, great job. This is what we can do to help fix X, Y, and Z. All right, so again, this is a good opportunity for you to, to give your input in their product. Um, and also help your students to reach SMART goals, and this is just an acronym, uh, essentially to have specified, measure, attainable, relevant, and time bound. All right, um, it's one thing to meet, it's another thing to meet and waste time. All right, we've all been there to where it's like we're meeting for an hour, but we really only rehearse for 15 minutes because of distractions, because of this and that. All right, so by using this acronym SMART, it'll help your students reach their goals um, effectively. Continuing, also having your students to be uh, uh, to use uh, a metronome um, and audio recorder as well too. Uh, I'll talk about acapella for the people who don't know um, what that is in a second, but having um, uh, a metronome, I mention this all, all the time to all my students, just two friends are not going to lie to you. Consider them their best friend. A metronome and a recorder. What happens when we have a metronome and then we start playing and then we get off? The first thing we do is look at the metronome. The metronome is like, no, that's you. <laughs> it's like, that's you slowing down. That's you speeding up, all right? So having a metronome will keep us honest. Another thing that will keep us honest is the audio recorder, all right? Because remember, think about the first time when you heard your voice on a recorder. You're like, Ugh. <laughs> is that me? Yes, that's you, all right? So by having um, your students to record themselves often, now they have an accurate representation of what they sound like in front of the horn. Because it's one thing to sound, you know how you sound like behind the horn, but the bell is in front of you. This is specific to trombones, trumpets, but to when you're going in, of course, the bells are up. But having the recorder and then having them to, to listen to the overall ensemble, I've done this a couple of times to, the, um, to this ensemble, and I've done it without them knowing. And because of that, they don't have their guard up. And then after, and they can tell you, that was like, Dr. Murrow, we have a lot to work on. I was like, well, I'm glad you realized that. <laughs> All right? Because it's one thing for me to say, it's another thing for them to realize. All right? Acapella. Um, so acapella, for the people who are not uh, uh, familiar with it, this is a video and audio app that's out there. Um, there's a free version. There's also a, a full version where you can have the students to essentially record tracks. All right, you can have the same student record about four to 10 tracks, four to 10 tracks, I'm keeping time making sure that I'm not going over, four to 10 tracks, or you can have one student to record one track, the next student record the next track, and so on and so forth. So that way they have a, they have a chance to listen to their product, and now before they go to Souls and Ensembles or performing for a spring concert, they have an accurate representation of how they sound all together. All right. So again, acapella, I don't know, I'm not endorsed by them or anything like that. I just use it a lot. All right. Three, four. Performance outlets. This is very important. And um, this is essentially, I kind of uh, uh, touched upon them just a little bit. By having students to perform during intermission, during the concert, all right? Um, having them exposed to, to a live audience and not just in front of the band members and the, um, the colleagues. Have a pop-up concert during lunch, during the lunch period. All right, it doesn't have to be much. It could be like a five, 10 minute thing. So that way they're performing in front of strangers. Because what happens when you go into a large venue, you're performing in front of strangers. Now they're more comfortable to perform. Now they're no longer saying, you know what, I'm scared. It's like, you know, I've done this before. It's just a different set of strangers. All right, and also this is very important as well too. Uh, performing for community homes and um, 
uh, seeing like community, community homes and churches. This is great for community service hours. Great for community service hours. Students say, hey, I'm a couple of hours short for uh, community service and I'm a senior. Go ahead and put a group together and go to a church, go to a community home, and then you have your those hours. All right. Um, so yeah, so with all of this, this will help motivate the students to to keep this experience going. Because we don't want it to be an occurrence. There's a difference between an occurrence and an experience. An occurrence is like, okay, that just happened. An experience is long lasting, you're going, you're going to remember it. All right, so let it be an experience, it's not an occurrence. All right. So again, the overall goal um, is to once we establish the, the the chamber experience in our programs, um, as I mentioned towards the beginning of the, the presentation, it'll make our jobs a lot easier because now the students are now listening to what they need to do before you say it. Instead of saying trombones, watch our toe. Oh, they took care of it. Okay. All right. Uh, saxophones, watch the toe. Oh, took care of it. They took care of it in their own sectionals. We, sectionals is one thing. You can apply this in this chamber ensemble as well too, so that way that they're taking care of the things that you have to even have to mention. So that way, now we're working on making music instead of just playing notes, all right? Um, and again, as I mentioned, this will help your students to be self-sufficient and independent in their thinking, not just as a musician, but also as a person as well too. And as I mentioned earlier about um, just making sure that this type of experience is not just centered in January, February, and March. It should be a year-round thing, all right? So, last, this is one of the last things I mentioned to you. All right, hold it for a second. So, there are two, there's this guy here, all right? Now, um, a couple of years ago, um, I've, I've, I've given the same presentation at, at, at uh, Midwest um, back in 2016. Um, and what I've done is that I've compiled at least 20 uh, chamber works for trombone, trombone quartet specifically. Uh, some of these uh, selections are on the FBA list, some are not. All right, and of course we do our, do our research in order to, um, to find out. What I've done is I've essentially broken everything down in regards to key signature, time signature, clefs, how many measures, um, dynamics, and the range. So that way you have a chance to see, okay, before you even look at the music, you have information about the music before you purchase it, all right? Is this feasible for my students? Okay, it has about 137 minutes, and this is for six grades. Happen not good, all right? Maybe I need to go to the next one, all right? So again, this is a resource that you can use, and there are other resources for other instruments as well, too. I just wanted to take the time to go ahead and provide this for you guys, and if you ran out of copies, my information is on the front of the page, so that way you can uh, reach out to me. Um, and I plan to make a second edition of this with the updated um, information of that. Because of course, FBA um, uh, solos and ensembles and um, chamber works are always changing because we have new works every year, all right? So uh, this takes us to the end of our presentation. Um, are there any questions? That's what I like to hear. <laughs> No, um, so so again, uh, it's I'm over here sweating. Um, so it's, no, but it's good because it means I'm working. And you know, when we practice and we're on the field or when we're, in, um, when we're in this band room, if we're sweating, that means we're doing a lot of good. That means we're actually concentrating on making sure that we take we take care of the task. All right. I thank you. I thank you for being here. Hopefully, you learned something. You know, we laughed, we cried, and we learned something and this and that. Um, Please keep in contact with me. I'm available. Um, I'm in the Miami area, but I travel a lot. People who know me, they know I travel a lot uh, in this event. So thank you for being here. From the Florida Music Education Association, a certificate of appreciation to Dunwoody Murphy for presenting 2022 FMEA Professional Development Conference. Unique team, music education, building community on one note at a time. Building a better man through the chamber music ensemble experience, how to cultivate critically thinking and independent musicians, January 13th, 2022. Thank you so much.